Okay, I'm live. Oh, you are? Oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Do I think I'm live? I didn't get a notification on here. Here it is. But it takes forever to send out the notifications. Okay. All right. I'll wait for people to filter in. Dun 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 dun. dun. All right. People are starting to filter in. Let's put this on top chat, top chat no, live chat. All right. Hello, Toke Witch. How are you? Opal Owl, how are you? First few in here. So how's things going, guys? Today is an interesting day. My first day at my new job. So far, it's pretty cool. Uh, Tokwood says doing, doing well. How I'm doing good. So I yeah, today was the first day at my new job, and uh, oh, Opal just finished dinner. What'd you have? I we had uh, I had um, we ordered out. And I had shrimp and scallops. Mm -hmm. They were so good. Um, anyways, yeah, today was the uh, my first day at my new job, um, which was really cool. Uh, a lot of paperwork, which is typical. But people are nice, and, you know, it's... it's uh, People are nice, and it was a lot of fun. It was good. Let's give a few more minutes for people to... Oh, hi, Skyberry. How are you? Welcome. Welcome. Let's give it a few more minutes, and then we'll, then we'll start. Um, and I put a bookmark in my Kindle, <laughs> so I know I, I wouldn't repeat anything. Hi, Skyberry. How are you? Opal had noodles and shrimp. Oh, that sounds good. Noodles and shrimp's always good. We have noodles. And I had steak with mashed perturders. So good. So good. He's so adventurous. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Look, I look so cute today, don't I, with this shirt. Oh, I've been rocking the white, looking all pure and innocent and yeah. spiritual. My aura is like glowing, radiant white. It's glowing, radiant. It's blinding. It's blinding. His head's so large. Oh, we did have hair on my nose. That's <laughs> great. Anyways, hi everybody. Hi Skyberry. Hi Opal. Scroll up. I can't see who else is in here. Uh, let's see, we have Skyberry. We have Opal. Um, we hi have Kelsey. Kelsey. Oh, hi Toke Witch. Toke Witch. Yep. That's it. That's it. For That's now. It. For, now. For now. All right. Well, I'm going to get started. Just like class in the real life, you got to be on time. But I won't send you to detention. <laughs> and then this is the part of the class where I just ditch it and be like, I'm good. Bye. Yeah. Mr. Interested <laughs> over here. Anyways. Um, so I think we're going to pick up with um, Patterns of Magic. Ooh. Um, and again, I wish I knew what page it was, but it's class V. Oh, yeah, so that's four, five, six. Is that six? Oh, my God. I'm like losing my Roman numerals. V is five. Five. Yes. Six, seven. Yes. Yeah, so it's is class. Six. V I I is eight. No. What, do, what does it say? V is five. Yes. V I is six. Yes. 
V I I is seven. And V I I I V I wait V I I I is eight. Yeah, well, I don't have V I I I. I'm just saying. Oh, saying. Yeah, Opal Awa, she's the girl with the, oh my gosh, I love how, well, she's got the physical book. Yep, so it's class seven, Patterns of Magic. And um, yeah, we're going to dig into that. Page 44 in your books. Where is my physical book? I, I have the physical book around here, but let me, yeah, it's too far away. All right, anyways, Patterns of Magic. Okay, so introduction. Pattern recognition is a large part of the game. Um, a great part of wizardry, um, or a great part of wizardly seeing and thinking is pattern recognition. That is looking at a bunch of trees and seeing a forest, or uh, as in uh, stereograms, uh, looking at a bunch of squiggles and seeing. Uh, a three-dimensional scene. I know what he's saying there. Um, this kind of percep perception um, is also basic to, to science. Um, it has helped us uh, to understand uh, and create theories about, you know, the way the universe works, right? You think about it when you're looking out into the universe. I think it's just to kind of give that, the pattern, it gives that, to me, it gives that illusion of depth and it gives it, you know, perspective, right? And that's like when I look at the stars at night, right? It's not a big flat canvas. You know, there might be a star here and a star here. And sometimes even this star in the back is bigger. So it looks, and, and it's really weird. Um, and then, you know, it, it, and there's uh, um, a couple of... Um, um, Examples of patterns uh, in, in the book, uh, the tree of evolution, right? Or a DNA molecule, which is that spirally thing with, you know, little ladder lungs. Um, so every time someone makes an important breakthrough uh, in, per in perception and sees the whole picture, it's an epiphany. You know, you've heard that expression, it's an epiphany. It's like finding a bunch of puzzle pieces all mixed up together with some right side up and others upside down. Our job is to sort them out, turn them around, find the ones that have similarities and fit them together piece, uh, piece by piece. Um, so skipping ahead, um, so um, magical folks, that's us. Um, and geniuses see patterns where others do not. Uh, in 1831, Charles Darwin looked at a variety of finches in, in the Galapagos Islands and saw a pattern of evolution of life as a branching tree. Okay, I don't know if I know that. I don't know where that gets drawn. But, but I have, like, if you notice... Like take it, take put it this way. If you notice how like birds fly south for the reason for the season, a lot of them go in like formations in patterns, you know. And they kind of wonder, they do they really know, right? Um. So, um, natures have symbols too, uh, found in many underlying patterns of structure. Um, one of the most important is the spiral. Uh, it is found everywhere from DNA, for, you know, from the DNA molecule in the body uh, through the arrangement of leaves and seeds and plants and flowers. Uh, the shells of snails, um, you know, are, uh, you know, spirals. Um, tornadoes, hurricanes are spirals. Uh, all the way up to the shapes of galaxies, which are spirals. Um Whenever you look, the spiral or another pattern is present. We'll discuss some of these patterns more in detail. Um, you know, and in the book, there's a, a examples of, you know, the, the DNA the, the DNA molecule uh, is a spiral, um, and galaxies are spirals. So it's interesting. It's just patterns. Um, so the book goes on to talk, like, lesson two, patterns, divination, and holographic. Uh, universe. Um, 
And there's a, a couple of things in here, like, uh, you know, uh, uh, you can make a divination box. So we can't really do that online. So we're going to kind of um, skip ahead to the next um, section here. Um, and we're going to talk about metaphysical concepts. Um, so that's a few pages ahead. Um, again, I don't have the pages, but uh, skip ahead and you'll see. Um, I think it's meant to be f lesson four, but they don't have lesson in front of it. Um, but it's, it's you know, it'll ha have a form in front of it. Um, and it's the glossary of metaphysical concepts. And we'll talk about some of these. Um so just as in science of physics or any, you know, anything like that, uh, the realm of metaphysics also has its own vocabulary. Here are a few important terms and concepts you should know. Um, the word metaphysics, um, it means beyond physics. Uh, the study and philosophy of the relationships between perceived reality and the deeper underlying universal reality and principles. Um, mundane, uh, mundane, we use mundane to describe worldly, you know, uh, sacred, sacreds, you know, uh, the book says, especially imbued with the essence of divinity. Um, profane, um, is the opposite of sacred. Uh, the word occult, uh, it's, you know, means for, for hidden. Mysteries, things that can only be known through experience um, and which cannot be communicated verbally uh, or in writing. Such are often conveyed as part of uh, an initiation. Initiation, uh, that's a ritualized transformational experience that introduces one to a new reality. Uh, esoteric, I use that word a lot. Uh, esoteric is hidden, implicit, experiential and inner. I also think esoteric is um, kind of higher, like esoteric knowledge. It's mystical, my, uh, you know, mis mystical. Um, uh, exoteric is obvious and explicit. So it's the opposite of that, right? Um, esoteric is that we know it's there, but is it you know, can you put your hand on it? Is it tangible? Is it tangible? Thank you. Um, is it literal? Esoteric is not literal. Exoteric is the obvious. It's what's right there in front of you. Um, arcane or arcana, secret mystery and mysterious. Another word for all things esoteric and occult. Um, arcana are things that are arcane in nature. Uh, paranormal. Um, that's so it's defined as alongside. Why do you have this aim in this way? I don't like it like that. There we go. Um, they define it as alongside normal. <coughs> um, I like to add to that. It's at you know the it's abnormal, right? It's not every day. Um, supernatural is another word. Um, what is supernatural? <coughs> uh, that which apparently goes beyond experience or existence in the natural world or cannot be explained through known natural laws, right? Supernatural. Uh, anomaly or anomalous, we know what that is. It's just something unusual. Um, archetype, uh, the basic pattern or idea in the collective unconscious from which all things in the same class of representation. Um, okay. <laughs> well, that one, that one kind of throws me a little bit. Um, path, that's a method, a system, or an approach uh, to magical or mystical knowledge. Adept means arrived or attained. You become adept at something. Uh, mystic, one who pursues the philosophical and spiritual side of magic. Uh, enlightenment, <clears throat> that's a state of deep and total awareness, experiencing constant connectedness 
uh, with all and everything. Um, you know, and there's a few more. If you have the book, you guys can uh, um, kind of move, go through those uh, on your own. All right. I want to move ahead um, <coughs> to where it says course two, uh, nature. Um, so I'll give you a, so kind of flip ahead until you see, you'll see the, you should see this. It, it's, uh, it's got a picture in it. Oh, there it is. A picture of, uh, looks like a woman holding like a Christmas ball or something. Ah! All right. There we go, page 47. Opal's good at following along. She's going to post those pages for us. All right, course two, nature. Um, and it says natural mysteries. Uh, the most beautiful experience we can have is the mysterious. Uh, it is the fundamental emotion which stands at the cradle of true art and science. Albert Einstein. Um, introduction. Life, universe, and everything. Throughout the ages, wizards, philosophers, and scientists have sought to understand the great mysteries of life, the universe, and everything. Wizards work with energy, which is information, right? It organizes itself into patterns um, and does not exist except in dynamic relationships. Uh, by being able to sense and understand these patterns, a wizard can position him or herself to be moved in a desired direction by the unfolding flow of events and still be able to alter the flow through his conscious perception. Remember we, we spoke a little bit, Pat, uh, you know, in a previous live uh, lesson that, you know, how wizards and visualize conducting magic is more like changing the outcome through manipulating the probabilities it's it's kind of shaping a path if you kind of you know if that makes any sort of sense um the nature of the secret in the ninth discourse of the um <laughs> whatever that is and out of respect for my tongue i'm not going to say it no it says uh Bhagavata Gita. Um, it is said that the great secret of the universe, of life itself, um, had several characteristics that would mark it as a true secret. First, the secret had to be um, uh, in, in intuitional. Intuitional. That is capable of, oops, capable of being known by anyone wishing to know it and not dependent upon outside teaching or being revealed by an adept. So what we mean by that is intuition is kind of like what comes natural. What Like what comes natural. Here's an example. When doing card readings, I read intuitionally. Meaning, I don't memorize what the cards mean. A lot, some decks, I don't even open the book up to see what the cards mean. I just look at the pictures, and they speak to me intuition intuitively. So that's intuitional. Um, that's you know that's one of the natures of of the secret. You know, first the secret had to be into uh, intuitional. That is capable of being known. By any, you know, by you know, just intuition. You're not taught to it. Um, second, it had to be righteous, that is lawful, within the bounds of the cosmos, according to universal property well, principles. And third, it had to be pleasant beyond measure. Right, that is, the secret had to be life enhancing, and exceed. The pleasure of earthly existence. Um, so let's see. Here are two easy lessons. Everything is connected to everything else. Um, 
We are part of the sea and the stars. We are part of the winds of the south and the north. We are part of the mountain, moon, and Mars. And the ages have sent us forth. And I guess that was written by William Ernest Hanley. Okay, so all of it, every atom and every cell in your body, you and your family, uh, friends and neighbors throughout the world, every living creature and plant upon the face of the earth, every planet, moon, and comet in the solar system, every star in the Milky Way, uh, every galaxy, the vast infinite news universe are all connected into this great web of unity or one great universal internet of space and time, matter and energy. It's, yeah, I, I think it's when, when I return, when, when I refer to the universe, the universal energy, that's what we're talking about. This interconnected web, we are all connected um, together, whether we realize it or not, you know, it's, and it's not just the people, it's us and objects and, and, you know, us and other animals and everything, every atom, we're all connected by this, this energy. Um, uh, lesson three. So we'll, whoops, I went too far. Yes, yeah, so we'll skip on to the next page where it says lesson three. It's alive. There is no matter as such. All matter originates and exists only by virtue of force. Uh, we must assume behind, behind, behind this force the existence of a conscious and intelligent mind. The mind is the matrix of all matter. Uh, that's a quote by Max Planck. Um, he is uh, oh, a Nobel Prize winner, winning father of quantum theory. So it's based on like, quantum theory. Um, anyways, just as everything is connected to everything else in one great web, wizards know also uh, that the whole thing is alive. Um, your body is composed of sever several trillion cells, each a living system of itself, um, but together compromising uh, the greater um, synergic unity that is you. So I, I kind of believe in that, right? If you think about it, you look at the cell, it's got this living thing, right? Which forms organs in our body, which forms our body, but it just goes on, right? Forms the, the house that you live in, the town that you live in, the state that you live in. It's all part of this ecosystem that is Mother Earth, the entire Earth. It's like a living, breathing thing. You know, and then the earth within the universe, again, it's like one little part of this greater, bigger living thing. So it's alive. We're all connected um, by that way, you know. All right. Lesson four, the balance. Um, the world is in balance, <coughs> in equilibrium. A wizard's power of chain of um, changing and summoning can shake the balance of the world. Um, it is danger, our what? it is danger, our that power. It must follow knowledge and serve need. To light a candle is to cast a shadow. Yeah, I didn't understand all of that, but that's uh, you know a quote by. Uh, Ursula K. Le, Le, Le Guin. Gwyn. Le Guin. Maybe it's Le Guin. But I believe that there is a balance to everything, right? Um, you know, the when you talk about like yin and yang and, uh, um, you know, every force has an equal and opposite reaction. Um, and that's kind of, I believe that, you know, even even in magic, right? When you, when you, you know, cast a spell or, you know, do a ritual for something, um, it comes at, you know, there's a cost associated with it, you know? Um, it, it's, everything's in that balance. The universe gives, it takes something away. Um, it's, you know, which is why I really, I, I really love to be balanced. Um, 
Uh, let's see. All things in the world, in many worlds, the universe and the multiverse are in a state of equilibrium. This means a cosmic balance in which every action has its equal and opposite reaction. Light balances darkness. Positive balances negative. Uh, antimatter balances matter. And so on. You know? Right, and I like that when he says every light, you light a candle and it casts a shadow, right? Isn't that the truth? Right, you light a candle and everything, you know, it makes, you know, the, the, the brighter the room, the, the more pronounced the shadows are. Um, lesson five, the circle of life. Um, one of the most important distinctions between the magical view of life and the mundane's view concerns the great circle of life. The mundane view of time as linear, you know, everything goes in a, in a line. Um, that is seeing time moving forward in a straight line from beginning through middle to end. But the magical people, and particularly wizards, all of time moves in cycles. Um, and what goes around comes around again. This is especially obvious in the circle of life. The journey of every living being from birth through life to death and around again to rebirth. Um, as, as we see the wheel of the year turn through the seasons, from the new birth of spring through the ripening of summer to the harvest of fall, uh, to the barrenness of winter and around to spring again, you know, it's the circle of life. You know those flowers that exist, right? Um, what do they call them? Like seasonals. I don't know. There's certain ones that, you know, they they grow up in the spring, they wilt away and die in the fall, and they pop up again. Um, Lucian and I were out on a walk um, yesterday, and uh, just kind of looking for signs of spring, looking for signs that uh, Persephone has made it up from uh, the underground. And, you know, and there are out there. Um, here where we live in Rhode Island, uh, the state flower is the violet. That's our state flower. But um, those are flowers that bloom again every year. And we saw, we saw you know, some around, you know, around there. So that's that circle of life, right? In faith, we might believe in reincarnation. Um, and another good example of cycles, right? Entertainment tends to cycle. Have you ever noticed that, right? In the 70s, we had disco, which was dance music. Um, then, then into 80s, it was pop. And then it turned into you know, the hair band rock. And then in the 90s, it was, you know, alternative rock. And then we get back into the end of the 90s and 2000s, it's back into a more funk dance. So even that has like this cycling effect, you know, it's everything, everything goes in a circle. Um, lesson six, cycles of time. To a wizard, it is clear that time does not move in a straight line, but in spiraling cycles. Um, the hands of the clock go around, but move forward one hour in each turning. So in other words, yeah, you have a, a cycle, right? you got a cycle, spin it, cycle, starts moving forward. The cycle of the days, the cycle of the planet rotating. It's like cycles of time. Um, pretty interesting. Um, so that's uh, that's lesson six. We're going to skip over geological ages. That's something you can kind of read on your own. Um, we'll skip. Um, well, let's talk a little bit about uh, zodiacal eons. Oh, no, that's yeah. These are OK. No, I'm sorry. These are like cycles of time. Um. Like you have, you know, historical errors, um, eon, zodiac, zodiacal eons, which is 2,167 years, um, uh, geological ages, 37 million years. So, so there's different, you know, classifications of periods, if you would. 
Um, okay. Let's look at lesson seven. So skip ahead a few pages to lesson seven, time traveling. Um, I want to, <laughs> yeah, I, I'm just, I really want to see what he's written a little bit about time traveling. Um, okay. Imagine you are walking along a path through a rolling countryside. Sometimes the path takes you into deep valleys with forests on either side of you. You cannot see the sides and you cannot see far ahead. But you have a map that you are following and the landmarks along the way are marked on the map. Eventually your path brings you to the top of a hill. From there you can look back over the path you've already traveled and you can look ahead over the path yet before you as far as at least the next hilltop. So from this high vantage point, you can, you take out your notebook and you draw a new map of the road ahead. You mark it, you know, you mark on it, the rivers, the forest, outcroppings, the villages, whatever along the map. This is how your path through time appears to a wizard. Um, as the various cycles of time turn and turn again. Um, kind of, sort of. Kind of, sort of. I think of it as... Um, I think of it as a little bit different. Because the only time or period where I, you know, have had, like, premonitions uh, and or revisited places in the past path is kind of through astral travel or through deep meditation and um or even journeying we talked a little bit about that that you know i have you know i i um i don't have i subscribe to the theory of the multiverse um this is kind of going off the book a little bit but what the multiverse is is that at any point in time there's another reality. There's an infinite no number of different realities, all in threads across the the existence, right? And you move back and forth in these threads. So, you know, when you hop to another thread, if you would, you know, think of it as a rope. You know how you have a rope and it has different little, if you look at it closely, different little threads in there? Um, that's kind of like how I view the multiverse. And I believe that you can have foresight in the future of the multiverse and in the back, but you can also travel to different realms through astral travel. That's kind of what I believe astral travel is. Kind of interesting. All right. We're going to skip ahead. And let's see. Um... Let's see where we want to go. Let me give me a second. Da, 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 da. Wow, there's a lot of okay, I gotta go back. A lot of stuff. Okay. All right. Let's go, I think, let me see. We're going to skip over the great work in The Awakening, and let's go to class two, um, The Soul of Nature. Um, this is a little writing. I am, I am a paradise of deep wilderness, the soul of nature and the life of the divine. Fragrant and fertile is my body. Touch me in the petals of every sweet blossom. Through abundance, you shall know me. I am thy oasis, pouring forth the waters of life. <laughs> um, so he wants to talk a little bit about personifications. So part one, introduction to personifications. Um, my favorite sequence in Disney's original Fantasia, and this is from the book, um, was Beethoven's Pastor, you know, uh, pastoral symphony enacted against the uh, a tapestry of Greco-Roman mythology by centaurs, unicorn, um, pegasi, uh, and a tipsy Bacchus. <laughs> um, there, 
appeared for the first time on film several of the old gods. Um, and he says Jupiter, Vulcan, Diana. Um, at the very end of the sequence, when Knox draws her veil of night over the Arcadian landscape and a thin crescent of a new moon appears against the stars and the camera closes in to reveal Diana standing on a cloud flanked by a deer and she draws the bow of the moon and shoots <coughs> um, a meteoric arrow across the sky. Well, that got me, he says. Um, I was hooked. Eventually, I even created a statue inspired by that image. Um, I know that I can actually have a Diana statue over there. Um, so understand that these various uh, personalization of nature forces are just that. As death so often says uh, in Terry Pratchett's Discworld novels, I am um, I am an anthropomorphic personification. That's a big word. That is the representation of an idea in human form. Um, from millennia of observations, we have found that natural forces behave, behave as if they actually are such embodied creatures like just like unicorns and deities and centaurs. Understanding and interacting with these uh, anthropomor anthropomorphic uh, <laughs> or anthropomorphized forces works better for most wizards when they think of the forces uh, in this way. Um, what he's talking about here um, is, you know, the personification of things. Um, Mother Nature, right? We believe that Mother Nature is an entity in, in sorts that, you know, controls nature on Earth. Um, right? Even some of our Greek gods, our Greco-Roman gods, in, you know, will affect the, uh, you know, what we see, right? Poseidon causes the storms at sea. Um, Apollo drags the sun across the sky. Uh, Diana, well, she does the same by the moon. Um, you know, um, it's that personification. Um, the Father Time's another one, Kronos. Um, right, he's you know the uh, the the god or the one in in control of time. Um, hold on, I need a wink. I need a wink. Ah, I need a wink. Oh, let me hop into the comments. You know, I haven't um, I've been kind of reading along and I've been ignoring everyone. Uh, let's see. Um, hi, Arlene. How are you? All right. Hi, October. How are you? Did I miss anybody else popping in? All right. Cool. Yeah, this is... Uh, what is that? Page 16 by, oh, the Amazon link. Is that the link to the... I don't know what that is. Um, is that the link to the... Is that the link to the book? The Grimoire for the Apprentice Wizard. All right, let's talk about a few of these. Um, I think it talks about... Yeah, let's talk about some of these. Um, the Star Goddess, uh, Nyx and Astra. The Star Goddess... Uh, is the personification of the night sky with all the stars. The Egyptians called her Nut. Okay. Uh, the Greeks, she was, I think it's pronounced Nyx. Um, to the Romans, Nox, from which we get the words equinox and nocturnal. Interesting. Um, and we call her a night. Right. The Milky Way is said to be the milk of her breast. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Expressed across the heavens uh, to nourish life um, and all the infinite 
infinite worlds. Uh, she is a spirit and body of our galaxy. Um, of her are born star systems and planets, including, you know, of course, Earth. Mm. That's interesting. Um, <clears throat> So let's see. The original name, now we'll talk about Astra. The original name Astra is the root of many names, you know, for the goddess of the evening star, or literally Eastern star, Ishtar, or East, you know, or Esther, Aster, you know, or, or you know, there's a bunch of different uh, uh, examples. Um, goddess of fertile spring, whose festival is Ostara, or Easter. See how these words kind of fit together? Um, celebrate at spring equinox, right? It's, it's, it's the spring equinox. Um, the eastern star, however, is actually a planet, Venus. Um, the Roman name for this goddess, right? So now we're talking about the goddess who I refer to as Venus, you know, because I follow the, the Roman um, Right. Um, skip ahead. We have Father Son or Soul, one of the most powerful and universal representations of divine masculinity. Uh, is the Sun God? Um, he was called Ra by the Egyptians, uh, Helios by the Greeks, and Soul by the Roman. I believe this is a little different than Apollo. Um, I think. So Apollo, I thought Apollo was god of the sun. A little confusing, but we'll we'll continue on. Um, as the blazing heart at the core of our solar system, Sol uh, supplies all the energy um, for life on Earth. Uh, plants convert sunlight into food, um, which nourishes animals, um, and the burning of organic material. Uh, to warm our bodies and to cook our meals. Interesting. Sister, that's moon, sister moon, uh, Luna. Luna is the Roman name for the lady in the moon. From the earliest times, most human cultures have considered the moon to be feminine. Uh, in ancient Greece, she was called Artemis, um, Diana, um, that's the Roman or, or, uh, Selene, Selene. Um, she is Hina in Hawaiian and, um, I think it's Ichel in old Mexico. Um, Luna has three faces corresponding to the three faces of the moon, waxing full and waning. Um, she is thus identified as the triple goddess, uh, maiden, mother, crone. Uh, corresponding to the ages of women, right? Um, interesting. Uh, and as the moon controls both the tides of the sea and the tides of women's bodies, she is seen as goddess of magic and mystery. Um, she's worshipped by witches everywhere um, who gather in her name uh, at the full moon. Interesting. That's the goddess of the moon. So this kind of goes a little bit. I don't know what pantheon. So I don't. I kind of get a little bit confused with the with the, the sun god because. Oh no! Wait a minute. Okay, I didn't read on. Um, some of the many sun gods worshipped throughout the world have included Apollo in Greece, uh, brother of Artemis. Okay, yeah. So I, I guess what he's doing here is covering different pantheons. Um, but I'm going to kind of talk about it in terms of the Greco-Roman because that's, you know, what I follow. So, yes, Sister Moon. It's actually, to me, it's Sister Moon, Brother Son, uh, both children of uh, Zeus. Um, all right, moving on. Now, here, we'll go on to lesson three, Mother Earth and her children. So we all know Mother Earth or, you know, Gaia. Um, uh, so it begins, let, let's, let's read. So begins the Homeric hymn to Gaia, the earth mother. 
Um, Gaia is the name given by the ancient Greeks to the primordial, primordial planetary goddess worshipped, excuse me, worshipped by humanity since the dawn of the Stone Age. In Hesoid's Theogony, uh, the ancient Greek creation story, Gaia was created by light and love from the primal cosmic chaos. Uh, her first offspring were um, Uranus, um, the heavens, fertilized by um, cometary arrows of uh, Eros which means love. Um, Gaia gave birth to all of the world's plants, animals, titans, god, goddesses, and, of course, humanity. So Gaia is the mother of every. So she's the start of everything. Um, the Romans called her Terra, from which we get the words like uh, terrestrial, right? Um, terra, he puts terraforming. Well, Terraforming. Well, I'm going to skip over that. Um, every culture on Earth has had a name for her, and many of them, such as Peruvian um, Pachamama, Pachamama, or Pachamama, um, are a, van a variant of Mama. Oh, I guess that's where the interesting. The our variant of Mama, the first word most human babies speak. Hmm, interesting. All right. Uh, there's a little task in here. Make an ice aged matraca, matrika. Um, might be something I'll try. Um, so let's see. Uh, the, let's skip ahead. The first children of Gaia. The first children of Gaia, if I'm pronouncing that right, are what we call the three great kingdoms of life. These are plants, animal, and fungi, uh, the basic divisions of all multicellular organisms. From the point of view of our magical personifications, these manifest as five. Two sets of twins, the green and the red, and the loner of the gray. Um, so let's look at green, the green the green maid or called flora um green goddess is more than a, a salad dressing uh she is by far the eldest daughter of gaia for the first green algae appeared in the ocean or the oceanic womb of mother earth over two and a half billion years ago her latin name flora has been given by scientists to the entire queendom of plants she is usually shown uh, with a face of flowers, uh, spilling forth from her um, bounteous cornucopia. Flowers, fruits, vegetables um, are especially associated um, with the green goddess, as they are the ova or eggs of plants. Like the green man, the green maid also undergoes annual vegetation, you know, an an the annual vegetation cycle of birth, life, death, and rebirth. You know, from the planting through the harvest and then back again to the season of planting. It's that cycles again, right? Um, and we'll talk a little bit about the green man who is Floras. So we got Flora. And Floras, the green man. Um, Floras, the, or the green man, is the masculine aspect of the vegetable kingdom. Uh, he came into being with the first sexual uh, differentiation um, of plants into male uh, and female around 300 million years ago in the form of the earliest seed bearing plants. Um, or conifers, as they call them. Flores is the pollinator, um, and the seeds and grains are associated with him. Uh, as the garden god, he is a generous spirit of vegetable, of vegetative fertility, who teaches us uh, nurturing and sharing, um, providing bread, juice, wine, 
uh, from his body and blood for our tables. You know, I guess all of that comes from um, a sort of um, seed, if you kind of will. Um, and this task, uh, the green mask, we're going to skip that. Um, let's move on to the red maid, um, Fauna. Uh, Fauna is the Latin name for the kingdom of animals. I guess that's, you know, you, you see, you get, you know, terms like fawn. I guess it comes from, I guess it comes, uh, kind of similarity there. Anyways, she is the wife of four and us, as we probably will learn in the, you know, the next few minutes, but the wife of Faunus and the feminine personification of the spirit of all animals, including humans. Um, she's called the red maid because of the red blood coursing through the veins of animals. Um, Fauna is the lady of the beasts. All right, and we'll move on to Fornas, the red man. Fornas is often called the horned one or the horned god or uh, or pan. Um, um, anyways, um, yeah, so pan and seranunas, nunos, which means horned one. Uh, that's kind of the most common names. Um, he is the masculine, the masculine personification of the spirit of all animals, and thus he wears um, their crown of horns. Okay, so that's what I mean, that's where the horns come from. Fornus is the god of fields, shepherds, and prophecies. Uh, he also, he's also the leader of the fauns, uh, the Roman branch of Greek satires. Fawns and satires resemble humans except for having goat's feet, uh, tails, pointed ears, and short horns. So it's kind of like what he what he kind of looks like. Okay? So that's that's our four, right? We've got, you know, um we've got the green man and the green woman, right? Uh, the red maid and the red man. And now we have the gray one who's kind of by himself. The gray one, Mycota. Mycota is a Latin name for the queendom of fungi. Fungi. The fungus group includes mushrooms, molds, and slime molds. The first fungi or fungi appeared on Earth over a billion years ago. Unlike flora, Mycota cannot turn inorganic substances into food but can only live off of other living things, um, either as parasites um, or saffro, saffro fights or whatever, um, which is basically growing from decay on, on the dead. Mushrooms are the only tiny fruits poking up from intricate networks of fibers that spread underground over huge areas. So underneath the ground is like these fibers, which is where, uh, you know, how they're all connected. Uh, these fibers are called mycelium, and they very much resemble the nerve fibers in the human brain. Um, some of these mycelium networks are so huge that they are, in fact, the largest living things on Earth. Uh, the spirit of mycota is vast and deep. Um, and I don't know if it says it in here, but something to think about is fungi don't have like a sex, like male plants, female plants. Are we talking about fungi? Yeah, you don't have a male mushroom and a female mushroom. Oh, I wonder if that's why it's gray. Interesting. Hi, Auntie Mama. Welcome. Um, and this is the link to the book that we're using. And we're coming right up to about an hour. Um, let's see where we are. Uh, nature spirits. Oops, let's see what I want to. All right, yeah, let's let's push on to this little part, and we're going to stop at elements. Um, so lesson four, nature spirits. 
are what they call divas. Diva is a, a, a Sanskrit from you know word for spirit. Um, I guess Sanskrit's for, for, uh, from India, but diva means spirit. Um, it is the root of such words as divine, divinity, divination, and even devil. Natural spirits of all kinds are called divas. Um, I'm married to a diva. Uh, girl. Girl! Girl! <laughs> but please! Um, but divas. Um, they are the personifications of various places and aspects of inanimate of, of inanimate nature. Divas may manifest themselves through such things as animals, uh, insect noises, a rising wind, or sudden presence of a flock of birds, or anything. Right? You ever just have the feeling? Oh, guys, that is the link on Amazon for the book that I'm using. It's called The Grimoire for the Apprentice Wizard, and mine's out of reach, or I would show you, but it's not here. There we go. Anyways, right? You ever have that feeling that you're being watched, right? As as you as you improve on your skill of, um, you know, just being sentient and and uh, you know, opening your mind up, you know, through meditation, you know, to the, you know, to the things that are out there that can't be seen, you know, you'll 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 feel right the spirits because I do all the time. I feel when something divine or something spiritual is nearby. You know. Um, all right, so let's move on. Nymphs in ancient Greece, such divas in in the feminine aspect were called nymphs, a word meaning young girl, uh, bride, or nurse. Um, they are invested with magical charm beauty and often supernatural powers um, as the female spirits uh, of the pulsing life of nature the nymphs were often uh, the companions of the lustful satires uh, nymphs belong to the oldest and deepest layers of Greek, Greek mythology um, populating seas, rivers springs, trees um, forests, mountains you know all over the place Right, so you hear you heard of nymphs and um, um, what are the other ones? The male ones, uh, nymphs and satires. All right, um, oceanids are nymphs of the ocean, and the daughters of Oceanus. Nereids are another family of sea nymphs, uh, the daughters of Neros, the wise old man of the sea. Naid, na, I don't know how to pronounce that. Naids are the nymphs. Nai, it could be naiads. Uh, are the nymphs? Where is it? It could be yeah, naiads. Naiad. Are the nymphs of running waters, rivers, streams, and springs? Uh, Orids or oristades are mountain nymphs. Dryads or hamadryads are forest and tree nymphs. Each has her own tree, and they live and die within their trees. And then we've known we we've known about fairies, or the fairy. The word fairy or fairy comes from the Latin word feta, or fata, fate. Um, fetas were three goddesses who um, visited newborn children uh, to, to determine their destiny. Um, the word became fey in Old English, meaning enchanted or bewitched. And fey became fairy, um, which meant both the state of enchantment and the enchanted realms. Um, there are many kingdoms of fairies uh, with quite different origins and characteristics. Some such as elves and pixies um, are believed to uh, have originally been ancient races of flesh and blood people. Then there are the nature fairies who are divas very much like the Greek nymphs. Many nature fairies uh, manifest as the spirits of particular flowers or other plants. Much... Um, 
much in ha uh, hamadrades. Um, plants much in hamadrades. I don't know what that means. Anyways, uh, as such, um, they uh, off to, or <coughs> often have wings of flower petals or of butterflies or or other kind of insects that are associated, you know, you know, some are associated with mushrooms, especially those, you know, that grow in a ring. Okay. Most fairies have powers of some kind. They can bring good luck or, or bad luck or ill. Some are kindly, others quite wicked. wicked. Um, but all of them are tricksy and need to be treated with the utmost respect. Thus, it is customary to refer to them as the good people or good neighbors or gentry. So as not to offend them, I should heed this. I actually have a fairy that kind of haunts me and has kind of played tricks on me for a big part of my life. And I call her the gone. And I will, you know, I will come home and I'll take my keys and I have a drawer that's one of my altars and I put the keys in there and I know I do it every day and I'll wake up one, you know, some mornings and, and that's when, you know, this trickster wants to play tricks on me and um, the keys won't be in there and I'll be searching high and low and I'll go to the, from the front of the house to the back of the house. And when I go back to the drawer, the keys will be back in there. This is the life of a wizard. <laughs> All right. We're going to wrap it up there. Um, let me put a bookmark here and we're going to pick it up next week with talking about elements. Um, we'll talk about some of the elements and elementals, earth elementals, air elementals, um, water elementals, lots of good stuff. All right. So, so that's where we're going to leave off. Ah, that was, yeah, because we've gone about an hour. And I know, um, ugh, I know when it comes to learning, after about an hour, you start hearing Charlie Brown's teacher. Wop, 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 wop. So for the next few minutes before I end the live, I want to kind of open it up. I haven't done much paying attention to the, um, to the chats here. Um, Um, I'll take a quick scroll back. Do any of you have any um, um, any questions, you know, or things you want to talk about? Uh, Opal says, "I love the Fay." Yeah, I, I I do too. You know, they're just these little tricksters that are just out there to kind of kind of keep us in check. I think, kind of, <laughs> um, you know. Um, Arlene says, how was your first day at the new job? It was, it was good. It was interesting. Um, a really cool place. Um, it was kind of like anything. It was, you know, really didn't do a whole lot of work. Um, it took, um, God, it took like half the day just to get my access worked out, my badge, you know, it's not a badge. I don't wear a badge. I'm not a cop. You're kidding. I'm going to be the weed smoking cop over here. But badge is in to get in and out of doors. We have these little cars with our pictures on them. Because um, it's a pretty high security place. But it was cool. You know, it was it was good. It went it went well. Um let's see. Um, thank you, Opal. This here again is the link for the book that we're using. Um from Amazon. It's the Grimoire for the Apprentice Wizard. Um, you can check right in the chat. Thanks to Opal. She posted it for us. Um, and I think if you have it, the app on your phone, you can kind of click on it and it'll bring you to, you can't click on the screen for the video, <laughs> but I'll show it there anyways. Um, yeah. Anyways, anyone else have any questions? Now's the chance. Oh yeah. You have no idea. Now, I love clams, and I – so here's the thing. I'm going to go on a rant because here's the thing. Always – you know, we always love to bitch and moan about where we live. 
You know, and I'm, I'm the same way. I'm like, because, you know, my state ticks me off sometimes. Um, but here's the thing. I, I've i eaten clams, you know, all my life. Let me tell you, I was raised, you know, I'm, I'm in Rhode Island. And, you know, I was, I grew up on Narragansett Bay. My parents had a boat and we used to anchor, you know, in some, shallower areas of the bay and we would just go diving for core hogs which is a big clam that's indigenous to this area and we would literally cut them open right there and eat them raw this is what i was raised on you know little tabasco sauce you slip it down it's a bit slimy so it slides right down and i think it's never gotten sick and you know i still eat a lot of seafood um typically i stick to local stuff. Um, you know, I, we have a few, we have a local supermarket that's just in Rhode Island and, uh, it's called Dave's and I'll go there to get seafood. Um, and, uh, um, um, I've never had any issues. So anyways, we go to the Asian market in Providence and I don't know, I don't, I, I I think it was a perfect storm of things. The clams were frozen and they were from New Zealand. And I just don't think I cooked them enough as they should be. So keep in mind, I'm used to eating clams that, you know, I've opened up and eaten raw. You know, so I don't like, I don't cook it like chicken till it's like rubber. But these things were packed in New Zealand, shipped, God knows you know, how long they travel. But anyways, yeah, I had the clams and, oh man, I literally, yeah, my body, my stomach was in purge mode and not to be gross, but, um, it was, it was, <laughs> it lasted a big part of the night. Like I threw up twice. And then after that, it was just dry heaving to the point where my abdomen, I still, feel a slight pain like and this is days later i swear i bruised ribs it was it was awful so yeah i don't care if <laughs> if 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 it comes from out of state i don't i don't care nope only local clams going in this mount in, in this mouth yeah seafood <laughs> barfs are the worst let me tell you and here's the thing <clears throat> you don't get sick right away either <laughs> Um, cause I had had the clams. They tasted good. Then after that, I had some noodles. I don't know. I, yeah. And here's the thing. It's like, I threw up, I barfed so violently. First came the noodles. Then when the noodles were done, I think it was like, um, a dumpling or something. And then that came up and literally it kept going on until those flipping clams came up. Not to, I don't mean to gross you out, but the, that's like, my stomach was like, that's it. I'm not stopping until these things are out. And oh, it was awful. It was awful. Um, Yeah. Not it. I tell you what, not because I, I, I had the alcohol barfs just once in my life or twice. And it wasn't as forceful and violent. It was like, oh, I'm getting sick. Mm, do your thing. Um, whereas uh, the seafood yaks, oh, I was like literally hugging, you know, Monsignor Bowl, begging for mercy. I was praying to every god that was up there. <laughs> oh, yeah. Every god that was up there. Awful. Yeah, alcohol. So I'm not a big drinker. You know, I do this stuff much more than I drink. I will have a glass of wine. Um, that hasn't always been the case. Um, but I've always in my life been a hard liquor drinker, like mixed drinks, because I don't like beer. Um, and here's the thing: the time I got sick, it was it was during Providence Pride. And, uh, you know, we were all, we all got a room up in the city 
Um, as a matter of fact, Matt uh, Lucian's brother came in, and you know it was the night before. We wanted it, we, we were it was the the evening. We had dinner, and we wanted to kind of pregame a little bit in the hotel. You know, we stayed in the city so we could walk to the clubs, walk to the event, and all that stuff. So the thing is, it's like, how do you pre when you only drink mixed drinks? Like I wasn't about to get. You know, a whole bag full of ingredients, and go back to the to the hotel and started, you know, becoming bartender Dave. I mean, I was just like, yeah, I don't want to do all that. Not just a pregame. Um, in hindsight, I should have just gone and gotten room service or something, and go down to the to the to a bar. Or something. <laughs> but anyways, we did what we did, and I bought two four packs of those big Dell lemonade shandy beer things I, I don't know anything that's any sort of beer at all is absolutely disgusting i think it tastes like carbonated urine uh but i figured i was gonna do that it's like all right so i drank like four of these things they were disgusting but i was feeling good but then we got to the to the block party. So pride and pride. I don't know if, uh, how local a lot of you are and, or if, if you've ever been to a pride celebration, but pride in, in Rhode Island is actually a lot of fun. Not, not so much. I mean, the, the pride event is fun, but the block parties afterwards, the, the, the clubs in the city. Um, and I think, a fair number of the, the the gay bars, anyways, do this. They will just out in front. They will just block off the streets and blocks out where their club is, fence it off, and it becomes this massive block party. And there's a bunch of you know, there's a few of them in the city that do that. Well, we we went to the block party, and we're doing, and I'm doing Long Island iced teas. So here comes the old adage. Did you call me the M word earlier? No. <laughs> um, lies and Manelli, lies. Shush. Beer. So here's the adage: beer before liquor, you'll never get sicker. Liquor before beer, you're in the clear. So I guess what that means is, don't drink beer and then follow it up with mixed drinks because you're going down. You're going down hard. Hard, hard. <laughs> right? We should start a whole new series called Barf Talk. <laughs> um, I'll always drink wine. That's it. I, me too. Me too, Opa. I'm not a big drinker, but I like I like my wines. Um, and it's not a... I don't treat it as a party drink, really. Um, it's just I like a glass of wine with dinner. There's nothing better than... Um, <coughs> You know, a nice red wine with with any sort of meat, steak, hamburger. Oh, I love my wine. Um, martinis. Yeah, I used to love martinis. Yep. <laughs> ah. <coughs> All right. Anyways, guys, I think at this point, it's been an hour and thirteen minutes. I, I thought I said this was going to be a short one. <laughs> it wasn't too short. Um, but we will end this here and, um, let me see what's next. Oh, well, now we're talking about drinks. Let's see. Wait a minute. What's this champagne at new year's? Um, I will drink champagne too. You know, I kind of put that in the classification as wine. I, you know, if, if people are doing like a, a champagne toast, um, I will do that. But, um, <laughs> Bailey's anytime. Uh, Bailey's anytime. No, it wasn't too long. I just, yeah, I don't want to, um, um, just throw too much information. Um, cause it, you know, it starts sounding like Charlie Brown's teacher. <laughs> All right, guys. Um, what's coming up this week? Today is Monday, Tuesday. Who do 101? Who bitches? do 101, butchers? Yeah. We're going to be going over the laws of hoodoo. Cool. Uh, Wednesdays, I will be doing my readings. 
Wednesday night readings. And Thursday, I will be doing my Santeria 101. And Friday. We will resume popcorn party. Yes, it has to happen. Sorry, I missed. I, I think I missed two popcorn parties yeah. in a row. Because I was sick and then you got Yes, the that's right. Um, Lucian was sick last, you know, the Friday before last. And then, yeah, I was dealing with my food poisoning issue uh, this past Friday. <laughs> Terrible. Oh, wait a minute. Is next Thursday the 13th? Oh, baby. You mean Friday? Yes. You just said it's next Thursday. No, I'm sorry. Next Friday, the 13th. <laughs> and what the hell is wrong with me? <laughs> I think my wizard hat's too tight. <laughs> yeah. Well, we got to do something Friday, the 13th. Let's line up a guest. Yeah. Yes. And uh, that's your job. And uh, we'll have um, we'll have a Friday, the 13th. Spooky. I can hit the microphone with my hat. Can you guys hear it go clunk, clunk? That's probably annoying. Um, but yeah. That's that. All right, guys. Thanks for joining. And we'll see y'all at the next one. Oh, and I'll do the little video. I keep forgetting the video. Wait a minute. Where is it? That's Banner's. Oh, there it is. Okay. Bye, everybody.